Well, good morning, church. Uh, Rob, thank you for a, a very kind and generous introduction. I, I'm fairly certain I won't live up to that. But it, it's, it's interesting to be in my season of life, and some of you can relate to this. You, you hear your age, and you say, man, what is that? You don't ever see yourself as, as being there. I had the chance to do a great friend of mine's wedding on Mobile Bay this past weekend. And I'm looking at those guys, the bride and the groom, and I'm saying, are you guys even old enough to be married? It's just a, a different season of life. But it does have its benefits. And one of the seasons, or, or one of the benefits that I've found that I have at this point in my life is actually figuring out a little bit of how God speaks to me. Now, I don't have it all down, but just for me personally, I've, I've kind of figured out some of that. And one of the ways that God speaks to me fairly consistently in my life is through repetitious themes. It's themes that he drops into my life. They just kind of pop up. Uh, I'm kind of a slow learner, so repetition is a good thing for me. And it typically starts as just, just a thought, or maybe it's just a conversation or a Bible verse. One of the things I love to do is get up and, and memorize a Bible verse each day. And many times God uses that to establish a theme in my life. And once it gets going, once it gathers some momentum in my thought life, I've learned to be sensitive to it, and I try to wrap it in words so I can articulate it. And really, such is the case with one of the themes that I'm working through right now in my life. Now, my wife would say it's just the voices in my head again, <laughs> and there are those, but... You know, I, I've always believed that the themes to be God-inspired, and they usually prove themselves out over time. And the theme that I'm kind of digesting right now is we fight every day. We fight every day. And here's what I mean by that. As believers in and followers of Jesus Christ, you and I have a very real enemy. You do know that, right? I mean, he's given several names in Scripture. He's called the liar, the deceiver. He's called Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer. He's called the devil, probably most frequently. But when we surrender our lives to Jesus, when we firmly anchor our identities in Christ Jesus, and we make the commitment to follow after him, really in every aspect of our lives, we also hang a giant target on our backs that antagonizes the enemy of our soul. He's really not happy about that. J.C. Ryle, in his classic book called Holiness, wrote this. He said, the child of God has two great marks about him. He may be known by his inward warfare as well as by his inward peace. Warfare and peace, combat and rest, the clash of armies and the calm of treaties. Christians may have more marks about him than these two, but nevertheless, he's a child in the Father's house, and he's a soldier in the Savior's war. My good friend, Pastor Randy Pittman, who pastors Calvary Chapel in Navarre, said it this way, as we live in Christ Jesus, follow him, and are made alive by him, we are thrust into the battlefield, and the forces of evil are on all sides. And it's with that joyous background <laughs> that I want to ask you to join me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Now, I'll be following a simple outline as we go along that's helped me tremendously in processing Scripture. And if you've heard it before, there's a good reason for that. I stole it from our lead pastor, Neil Spencer. Uh, first, what's the setting 
of our text. It's always important when looking at a text to place it in the context that it was presented. So we do that by kind of looking at the setting. And uh, Neil's an alliterator, so that's the first S. The second S is, what does the Scripture say? Now, we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed, so we need to consider what the Lord is trying to communicate to you and I this morning. And then number three, and this is the best one, so what? So what? Anytime God's Word is spoken, I believe it demands some kind of response from you and I, those that follow after Jesus. So what is our right response to God's Word that's been spoken today? And Pastor Neal does a wonderful job of reminding us about the importance of reading God's Word every day. Don't you wish there was a church? <laughs> And so hopefully you're doing that. Hopefully you're going daily in the Word with us. Uh, but your next step in that is to dig a little deeper, to find a way to process the Scripture that you're reading, to make it kind of the fabric of your life, so to speak, to apply it to your life. And so if you're not doing that now, I would highly recommend this simple method, setting, saying, and so what? It's very easy to work through. So here's the setting. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 20 of Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. And Paul is writing a letter to a church that was a part of his missionary journeys. And I would say it was a large part. It's been said that Paul spent more time with the church at Ephesus than with any other church in those three missionary journeys that he did. And because of that, he really probably had a circle of friends there, people that he did life with. I would say he had probably some deeper relationships in Ephesus that he had anywhere else. So he really had a deep love for these people. Um, I would call them in my life not, not just friends, but dear friends. It's relationships kind of on steroids big relationships, important relationships in your life. He was also the pastor of this church for a season, and they had birthed seven other churches out of this one church. Now, you've kind of seen that happen. Our church has planted a church in Destin, and we planted a church in Navarre. It's a good thing. I would say it's a healthy thing. And the church at Ephesus had a good reputation among all the early churches. They were known for three things specifically. They had a dependency on the Holy Spirit. They placed a great emphasis on the Word of God. And they were faithful in their commitment to God. And what that means is they... They really did that in every aspect of their life. It wasn't just a Sunday thing for them. They kind of burned their ships on the beach. They were all in. I kind of think of them as the Calvary Chapel of their day. And the letter is typically divided in half by chapters. Chapters 1 through 3 are kind of the doctrine of the church, the principles by which the church is functioning. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are more putting those principles of the church into practice day by day. Uh, these three chapters teach us how to walk with the Lord, teach us how to live in a spiritual family, and then they teach us how to fight spiritual battles. And these spiritual battles or spiritual warfare is our topic this morning. And you can probably guess the title of the message. It's called, I Fight Every Day. But the message is so much more than that. The content of this message is a collaboration of information that came from a group of pastors and a couple of really experienced war veterans that were able to share their experience in real-world modern warfare and brought these concepts to a whole different perspective for me personally. 
And I'm going to share some of those things with you. Uh, Rob said it was a year and a half in the making. It really was. Uh, because that's when the men's retreat was that most of this information came from. But God has kind of worked it and massaged it in my heart, and I just felt led to share it with you. So now that we have the context of the text, we're going to look at the text itself. And again, join me in Ephesians 6. I'm going to read verses 10 through 20, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Uh, Paul the Apostle says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be standing firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of this unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. And then comes the armor of God. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then Paul concludes with this, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too, he says. Ask God to give me the right words so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I'll keep on speaking boldly for him, as I should. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. Man, this has been such a critical section of Scripture in my life, understanding that we, we really do fight every day. We're in a battle with the enemy of our soul. And when we grasp hold of that realization, Lord, you give us the tools that are needed to fight. And so I pray, as your word is spoken here, that you would equip your saints to fight their battles well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, so Paul is bringing a close to this letter to his dear friends in the church at Ephesus. But he's got one more thing he wants to say to them. He says, finally. See, it's important. It's timely. I would say both in Paul's day and in our day today. It's the answer to the question, what do I do when spiritual attacks come? And it's important because they're going to come. Many of you know that. Now, Paul was a kind of been there, done that kind of guy. He was no stranger to spiritual attacks. If you know Paul's story, you know that. Uh, we know that some of his letters, including this one, were written while he was imprisoned for his faith. He's actually writing this while he's chained and in a cell. And it's not what we would think of as the modern prison system of the day with amenities. I mean, Paul was probably in a cave. It was damp. It was dark. He was in, in chains. And he probably only received the basic necessities when friends or family members would come by and bring them to them. And we know from 2 Corinthians that Paul endured multiple beatings, that he was stoned, and that's not in a good way. He was shipwrecked, and he spent some time, and this has got to be the worst. Paul spent some time in the deep, it says in the Bible. What he was actually doing was bobbing up and down, wondering if a shark was going to pick up his scent. Paul was living, I think. He was sharing from his personal experience 
that we fight every day. And he puts an exclamation point on his letter to the church at Ephesus to you and I this morning through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit with an important instruction on spiritual warfare. So Paul begins, a final word. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. Now, Bible commentator David Guzik says there are two essentials, two, in spiritual warfare. First, the realization that our strength and power are found only in the Lord. See, we need to know where our strength comes from when we're fighting a battle. It doesn't come from within. It comes from the Lord. And then that we put on the whole armor of God. Another translation says... We put on every piece of God's armor. And I think it's significant as a prelude to one of the most powerful sections of Scripture that we have in the Bible on spiritual warfare. Paul reminds us where our strength and our power comes from. See, it's only in the Lord that we find the strength that we so desperately need. Only in the power of his might that we're able to stand and to fight an unseen enemy. King David said it this way. He was one of the most powerful kings that we know anything about. He said, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my strength come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. See, we don't have to wonder and worry if we have the strength to make it work. Because we don't. We're just not able to do that. He is the one who goes before you, we're reminded in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not be feared. Do not be dismayed. See, it's the Lord who fights our battles for us. They belong to him, Scripture tells us. And if Ephesians chapter 6 ended right here, that would be okay. I think these two things, the Lord is our strength, and putting on every piece of God's armor by themselves, that would probably be enough. But Paul doesn't end here because he's, he's motivated, I think, by his great love for these people And he wants to lay out for them the how of spiritual warfare. And it's much to our benefit. Verse 11 says this, Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. The New King James Version here uses the word wiles. And it's a word that we don't hear every day. And it carries some important intel about the enemy of our soul. In the original language, the word wiles or strategies is methodia. And for you and I, it's the word method. And simply stated, it's a way of doing something. But listen, as it applies to the enemy, it's evil trickery at its best. It's the devil in the way that he organizes his evil attacks on us. And I think what Paul is saying here is that our enemy is second to none in employing this method of stumbling the saints. And our challenge, our goal in that is just to stand against it. We need to still be standing when it's done. And Paul continues, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. We're fighting against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. And first Paul says, hey, here's who your enemy is not. And I don't know about you, but many times I tend to think that my greatest challenges in life or against another person. Do you ever do that? You have somebody that you think is your problem? I mean, it's their fault because they did that 
Or can you believe that they said that about me? But Paul is saying that's wrong thinking. And here's what that means to me. If I'm in the middle of a conflict and I've set my sights, I've kind of focused all of my attention against another person, man, I need to change my perspective. I mean, the battle is much bigger than that. I think our need for Jesus is much greater than that. And because the battle is God-sized, wisdom says that I should put on a a God-sized suit of armor. Our battles are not against flesh and blood. They're against a very well-organized, very crafty, evil host. And I think that's what Paul was saying when he used words like authorities and mighty powers. He was saying that our enemy is really well organized. He has lots and lots of help. He studied us, and he has a plan of attack that he's working. He's not disorganized. He's not chaotic. He knows what he's doing. Therefore, verse 13 Put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. And two things I would leave with you from verse 13. First, Paul used the phrase, every piece of God's armor again. Okay, repetition is to place emphasis in Scripture. And what's being emphasized here or that there are many pieces of armor that make up the whole. I mean, it's like spiritual gifts in the church. The gifts that the Holy Spirit gives are not independent gifts. They're interdependent gifts. They all work together for the good of the body of Christ. They don't stand alone, but by design, God's design, they work together. And this is important. When you're putting on the armor of God, you don't leave anything out, not one piece. It's a complete suit of armor. And if you leave anything out, it means that you're exposed and that you're more vulnerable in the battle. Second, God's goal for us, our objective in battle is to win at all costs. That's not what Paul's saying. God will fight our battles for us. The battles belong to him. But what he expects of us, what he equips us for by giving us this armor is to still be standing when the battle is completely over. And listen, I don't think we're standing because he needs us or because he maybe has something more for us to do. I believe he wants us standing so that we can celebrate the victory with him. Doesn't that sound like our gracious God? I mean, he fights our battles for us, but he also shares the victory with us. How sweet is that? Winston Churchill, in a speech given before the British House of Commons, June 4th, 1940, as Germany was invading their land, he said this, we shall defend our island whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight on the hills. We shall never surrender. And I think that's the attitude that Paul is communicating to you and I this morning. The attitude that we have to have when we're facing an unseen enemy. Somebody that's strong, that's mighty that we can't even see. We never concede, we never give up, and we never surrender because God is on our side. And to ensure our success, God gives us, the Bible says, his own armor. It's not our armor, it's God's armor. And listen, it doesn't belong to him in terms of need or use. God doesn't need the armor. He doesn't use the armor, but it's his in design and function. See, the armor of God is kind of his the same way that my 2002 Frontier pickup truck 
is Nissan's. They designed it. They put together all the design features of it for somebody like me to enjoy and to use for transportation. I mean, the truck was intended to meet my needs, not their needs, right? And God's armor is the same way. My truck, I just get in it and crank it up. And all we have to do with the spiritual armor, with God's armor, we just have to put it on. We just have to be faithful to do that. And verse 14 says, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be prepared. And Paul begins his instruction about God's armor, these different pieces that we're to put on with the belt of truth. So in spiritual warfare, the truth of God is expressed as a belt. It's something that we fix around our waist or our midsection. And here's the real interesting thing about that. Even before core training, God knew the significance of our body's core. How many of you know what core training is? You've heard that term, right? It's strengthening the center of your body. If you're doing any kind of workout that you've been instructed on at all, you know that. And this, this belt of battle was designed by God to gird or to wrap around the core of our body. That's our lower abdomen and our lower back. Because those things are important in everything else we need. And if you don't believe me, hurt one of them. I mean, seriously. It impacts everything you do. Uh, I, I hurt my low back when I was in college, and it screams out to me sometimes when I move the wrong way. You feel it. Both medical and sports communities agree that core strength is critical in preventing injury, to reduce back pain, to improve lifting mechanics, in balance, stability, posture, and to improve athletic performance. And this is where soldiers like uh, a guy named Joe Kimbrell in uh, Calvary Chapel Destin and Jake Ray in Calvary Chapel Navarre really helped me out. They were so important to me processing this information, and I hope you'll see it as I did when I heard it from them, that God's armor from their perspective, man, it's timeless because God's word is timeless. See, he, he presented this information. This was written, no doubt, taking into account the soldiers of that day, the Roman legionnaires most likely. But as we consider God's armor from the perspective of modern warfare, this armor is just as relevant for us today. Soldiers know what you're talking about when you read this section of Scripture. So from a contemporary soldier's perspective, the belt I found holds many important tools of the trade. The belt serves as a, serves a soldier in tandem with and kind of as a backup to the soldier's vest. I mean, if you ask a soldier what the belt does... He'll tell you that it carries things that make holes and things that plug holes. Now, that's not a pretty picture if you're thinking about warfare. It, it carries things that make holes, ammunition. Carries things that plug holes like medical supplies. The belt augments the vest by carrying a soldier's sidearm, extra ammunition, a small medical kit. So in spiritual warfare, our belt is truth. And Jesus gave a, a great explanation of what this truth is as our source of sanctification and spiritual growth when he prayed to the Father and said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There's no higher authority for the believer in Jesus Christ when it comes to the truth than the word of God. It's absolute. 
It supports everything we do, and it holds all things together for us. Do you see the similarities to the belt? It's also a quick source of essential tools. I mean, the belt of truth supports your core attitudes, beliefs, and choices. Pastor Neal's ABCs. The belt of truth can prevent spiritual injury. Truth does that for us. It reduces spiritual pain and improves our spiritual load-lifting capacity. Rob mentioned this. I know I don't look like it now, but I was a power lifter in college. And the belt I wore when I was lifting was probably over an inch thick of layered leather. And I wore it to make sure in heavy lifts that something didn't come out if you... (laughs) Get the, get the impression. It, it kept everything together in its right place. The belt of truth does that kind of thing for us. It, it really balances all the different components of our life. It stabilizes us sometimes in awkward situations. We call on the truth of God's Word to do that. And it helps us to stand tall and to finish well. And please hear this. Everything else in a spiritual battle depends on your ability to know, to obey, and to apply the truth of God. Let me say that again. Everything else in a spiritual battle is dependent upon your ability to know, obey, and apply the truth of God. That's why I believe the belt is first. Some commentators say the belt's not even a piece of armor, really. Well, it supports everything else. You put it on first. And then once a belt was tied around the midsection of a Roman soldier, he would proceed with putting on his breastplate, the second piece of armor. Today, it's called body armor for our soldiers. And this is a piece of armor that encases and protects what needs to be protected the most. These are the things that would knock you out of a battle. The heart, the major veins and arteries, lungs and the body's respiratory system, the spine, the liver, the kidney, all of those things, if they're exposed and vulnerable, They can take you out of the battle, and they are exposed without the breastplate or the body armor in place. So spiritually, our breastplate, our body armor, as identified here in this scripture, is God's righteousness. It's God's righteousness. And see, our problem with that is we don't have any of God's righteousness in our flesh, And we're not capable of manufacturing it in any way. You guys know this, but you and I live in an affluent culture here on the Emerald Coast. I mean, I found that people in our culture, not not you guys, but other people in our culture, they're, they're quick to throw money at their problems rather than resolve them. So the natural theme would be, hey, how do I buy this stuff? How do I buy God's righteousness? But righteousness is not for sale. And I hope this is not news to any of you this morning, but our flesh is the polar opposite of God's righteousness. Just doesn't fit together. The prophet Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He's talking about your heart and my heart. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, clearly said, there's none righteous, no, not one. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not righteous. (laughs) They probably knew that down deep. But listen, the Bible teaches that there is one avenue and there's only one that you and I can follow to receive the righteousness of God. And here's what that means. In our spiritual battle, there's only one way that we can protect all those things that are vital to us surviving in battle. And his name is Jesus. See, Jesus is always the way for us. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of Christ in him. Jesus takes on our sin and he trades us and gives to us the righteousness of God. Now, I don't have any way of knowing where you stand in terms of a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. But I can tell you this, walking onto the spiritual battlefield of life, man, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. You need that kind of protection. I mean, we have soldiers among us this morning. They would tell you in a heartbeat, I'm not going on the battlefield without my body armor. It's important. I'm not going to do it. So our resolve, our only chance in battle is Jesus Christ. We need him. We always do. We're solely dependent on the protection of Jesus. Jesus Christ. His righteousness is the body armor that we need to survive. And at this point, the well-churched Southern Baptist boy in me wants to sing a song that we sang at First Baptist Church in Pascagoula, Mississippi years ago. I'm not going to sing it for you. (laughs) Tell my wife when she walks in for second service, I sang, and she'll love that. But I do want to just just recite a, a couple of verses for you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. And here it is, the climax of it, dressed in his righteousness alone. That's what we do faultless to stand before the throne. See, we're faultless when we put on his righteousness. And that's kind of a bonus of the breastplate of righteousness, our body armor of righteousness in the spiritual battle in my life and in your life is our right standing before a holy God. We can't get that by ourselves. That's another message, but don't miss it this morning. When God looks at you and I, He sees Jesus because of Jesus. See, he sees Jesus in us because of what Jesus has done for us. Next, having shod your feet with the gospel of peace, a soldier will tell you that the appropriate footwear is indispensable in battle. Just got to have it. Historically, The early Roman legionnaires wore open sandal-like boots that had thick leather soles, and they were held together with hobnails. But here's what they would do. They would take those hobnails, and they would also push them from the inside out, from the side that faces your foot to the outside of that thick sole. And what that would do, it would improve their traction. And, well, you can imagine when they stepped on somebody in battle. Not a good thing. So today's soldier wears boots that are custom fit to their feet. They're as tough as nails. They're engineered to provide a stable platform on pretty much any terrain. Water doesn't penetrate them. Metal shards don't cut them. They're made to remain intact regardless because they're needed. In our spiritual battle, our boots on the ground is the gospel of peace, God's Word says. Because knowing Jesus and living a life of humble obedience to Him, man, that gives us peace when the world around us is in turmoil. It's kind of falling apart in a state of chaos. It gives us confidence when others are doubting. And it gives us a firm footing to stand on when others are sliding down that slippery slope of sin. That's what our footwear does for us in battle. Paul told his son in the faith, Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. 
And Peter said this, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And sometimes I've found that it's in the crucible of battle. It's when you're fighting your hardest that God gives us the opportunity to kind of share our story with someone, how we survive the day-to-day challenges that we face, and in doing so, to influence those around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. These shoes remind us not to miss an opportunity that God provides. Just one foot in front of the other, and we allow the Holy Spirit to order our steps and share what we know about God. No one can refute your story of God working in your life. So I've got just a few more minutes to finish up, and we've got a number of pieces of armor left, and I'm going to mention them briefly, but may I ask you to consider finishing out what we started this morning? I mean, the shield of faith is one of my favorites. The, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit and prayer, they're all important weapons in our arsenal. Remember, if one's left out, you're exposing yourself. You're increasing the likelihood that you're going to be picked off by the enemy. And I've given you a tool, uh, the setting, the saying, and so what. So sometime this week, Just go through these again and kind of give them the time that they're due, if you would. So in addition to all these, Paul says, take up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the enemy. Our shield in the spiritual battle is the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. It's our trust, our belief in God's plan for our life. And yes, the shield is an individual weapon, but here's the thing. In ancient warfare, shields were used collaboratively. They were actually made to fit together and to interlock. And when you did that as a fighting force, you created this impenetrable wall to keep the enemy at bay. Man, they couldn't get around it. They couldn't get over it. And that's why we don't isolate or do battle by ourselves as spiritual soldiers. See, by design, we really are better together. That's more than just something we say here at Coastline. We're better together in the good times, and we're better together in the bad times. I have a group of guys that I do life with, and we're in touch with each other through a text thread all day, pretty much every day. And it's with great frequency that it comes up in our text thread to lock shields around one another or around someone specifically that's facing a particularly difficult challenge that day. And we don't do it because it's fun or because it's exciting or because we're kind of caught up in the moment. Man, we do it because we know that it's needed for us to be able to survive on the battlefield. Psalm 56, 4 says, I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? And that's the kind of faith that we need in battle. You place all of your trust in God, you lock your spiritual shields together, and you do that with the godly people that he's placed around you. And these shields are expressly designed to stop whatever the enemy is throwing at us. Verse 17, put on salvation as your helmet. Helmets are important in battle because head wounds are fatal on the field of battle. And today's helmet not only provides protection, but it provides vital assistance with communication and with visibility. Ask a soldier about that. Now, spiritually, salvation protects what we think in the battle and how we think in battle. Because we have a future that is safe and secure in Jesus Christ and guaranteed by His Holy Spirit, 
we can fight with confidence, and I would even say with reckless abandon on the spiritual battlefield. Man, we can fight like we mean it. Because at the end of the battle, we still get to go to heaven. It's guaranteed. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we're accountable. The word of God, it's our sword in battle, the offensive weapons for our battles. To a modern soldier, the weapons have changed somewhat. Primarily, it's a sidearm, a rifle, maybe an explosive charge. But there are three things you need to know about the weapons. First, the soldier needs to know about his weapon. And one of the first things a soldier learns in preparing for battle is to disarm, or excuse me, to disassemble and reassemble them quickly, efficiently, and accurately. See, he needs a keen knowledge of how the weapon works to keep it serviceable in the battlefield. Likewise, you and I, we have to know God's Word in battle. We've got to know it. Man, it's more than us just asking you to follow along with us day by day as we work our way through Scripture chapter by chapter. It's important in the battlefield. That's why we all make spiritual disciplines of reading and processing God's Word. Number two about the weapons, the soldier must be trained for proficiency in the use of the weapons. Me, for instance, uh, I know enough about an M16 to shoot my foot off. That's about it. But a soldier needs to be accurate and effective with his weapons before he steps into battle. That's why so much time is taken in the training aspect. We also need to be trained and led by the Holy Spirit to deploy the Word of God in our battles. And number three, a soldier must use his weapons within the confines of the rules of engagement. Now, some of you guys know what that means, but the short story is we also have rules that govern our engagement, and we get those through the Word of God. And finally, we pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion, staying alert and being persistent in our prayers for all believers everywhere. Write this down if you're taking notes. Prayer is the currency of warfare. Prayer is the currency of warfare. A soldier's mission is dependent on the allocation of funding and support for their mission. Prayer is funding our spiritual battles. Nothing happens without prayer in the spiritual. It drives everything else. We pray first, we pray last, we pray without ceasing because without the supply chain and the needed resources, a soldier... He's, his efforts are futile. They're useless. And I'll leave you with this. The follower of Jesus Christ is never alone in the battle. God's Word says He goes before us. He comes behind us. He promised to always be with us, and He'll even fight our battles for us if we'll learn to develop a dependency on Him and to fix our minds on him as our commander and chief. He's our commander in battle. And the application part of this, the so what, man, that's easy. It's in the first verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We realize where our power comes from, and we put on every piece of God's armor. That's how we succeed in the battles we face day in and day out.